Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 293 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. The FCPA Compliance Report is sponsored by the Red Flag Group. The Red Flag Group is a business advisory, information services, and technology firm that helps corporations, financial institutions, government, and SMEs to manage their integrity and compliance in their businesses and in their third parties. You can find out more information on the Red Flag Group at their website, www.redflaggroup.com. Today I have with me Saskia Zandia. Saskia is a lawyer at Miller & Chevalier in Washington, D.C. She is French-American and has written a firm newsletter, or co-authored, I should say, entitled France's New Anti-Corruption Law, A Game Changer, or More of the Same. It's a very deep dive into the new French anti-corruption law, SAP in 2. In this podcast, we uh, go through the new law, some of the uh, brief uh, history of French enforcement efforts, the expanded jurisdictional reach of the law, how the law creates a new anti-corruption enforcement agency in France, and some of the structural defects, defects that Saskia sees in it. We talk about the compliance program requirements of the law, and most interestingly, the whistleblower protections around the law. She also discusses the appeal of the new law to the French Constitutional Court and where that appeal may be headed and what the final resolution might be. The episode comes in at uh, just around 22 minutes. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to thank you very much for listening to the FCPA Compliance Report. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. Today, it is my distinct pleasure to have with me Saskia Zandier. She is a lawyer with Miller and Chevalier in Washington. Uh, we met last week at Matt Ellis's book signing for his new book, and it turns out she and a colleague have written a paper on France's new anti-corruption law. So I asked her if she might be able to come on the podcast and give us her insight into this new law, and she graciously took some time out of her day to uh, visit with me. So with that somewhat long-winded introduction, Saskia, thanks very much for uh, coming on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. It's an honor. Well, uh, I appreciate that. So um, I'd like to just jump right into it. And um, could you give us a little introduction into uh, the new French law, how it came about, and uh, what you understand uh, the French were trying to correct with this new legislation? Sure. So the, <clears throat> a new French law was adopted on November 8th of this year. And it's aimed at strengthening France's anti-corruption regime. France's anti-corruption law was already quite strong. It prohibited domestic and foreign bribery, both passive and, and active. And it went even further than the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in certain ways by prohibiting facilitating payments, for example. But in recent years, France has been hit very hard by the OECD, the United States, and others um, for its lack of enforcement of its laws. So this law, uh, which is commonly referred to in France as Sapin II, after the French minister that is, uh, has championed the bill, was introduced in March 2016. And this minister, Michel Sapin, um, was felt strongly about passing this bill. He had passed the first, ver an ar earlier version of an anti-corruption law and wanted to sort of close the loop, I think, largely before the French elections uh, coming up in the spring of next year, is sort of uh, part of his legacy. <clears throat> so the new law really stands to strengthen, strengthen the existing laws and increase enforcement. Um, and I'll turn it back over to you and see what particular aspects of the law you'd like to talk about, but that's the background on that law. Well, sure. And one of the things I've heard, I don't know if it's anecdotally or not, was that the French were actually more than a little irritated that three of the top 10 FCPA cases of all time uh, were French companies. So we had Alstom, Total, and Technip, and that uh, really since 2010, French companies have paid over $1.6 to the U.S. Treasury to resolve anti-corruption uh, enforcement actions and so I don't know if that would be a black eye to, to French um, uh, enforcement authorities or they wanted to garner some of those funds or they were tired of the U.S. government picking on French companies. But does any of that resonate with what, any of the reasons for this law being uh, passed? 
Absolutely. I mean, you're right. The $1.6 billion to the United States Treasury that otherwise could have gone to the French Treasury is a big piece of it. Uh, I don't think the French government will be admitting that they're doing this for financial reasons. But they certainly, my understanding is that the French met with the U.S. authorities um, during, over the course of some of those enforcement actions and asked that they allow the France to take the lead in the enforcement actions. And the U.S. authorities told them that France's enforcement was not strict enough and that the United States would retain jurisdiction over the matters. And so you're right, $1.6 billion paid to the United States and two French individuals prosecuted in the United States for anti-corruption, um, in anti-corruption matters. So that's certainly a piece of it, the financial piece, um, the independence piece, it certainly played a role. And the OECD was also pushing pushing France. As you know, the OECD has an anti-bribery convention. France is a signatory to that convention, and it requires uh, all signatories to have, have and enforce anti-corruption laws. So for many years now, OECD reports have been coming out that have basically slammed France on its enforcement of its laws. So uh, I was wondering if you might be able to give us a little bit of a brief history of, um, or at least a background into uh, anti-corruption efforts in France and how those efforts uh, may or may not have led to the enactment of, of this new law. Sure. So I mentioned this Prime Minister, Michel Sapin, who um, is the namesake for this current law. In 1993, France adopted an anti-corruption law, which is the initial Sapin law. That created the Central Service for the Prevention of Corruption, a new agency that was to handle anti-corruption matters. Uh, frankly, it was it became relatively ineffective, largely because the French Constitutional Council weakened its effectiveness uh, by stripping it of its investigatory authority. Um, so then in 19... 97, France took some additional steps at attacking corruption. In that, in that year in particular, France adopted a law prohibiting the tax deductibility of bribe payments to foreign officials, which was decades after the United States did it. But around the same time, its European neighbors did that. Um, and then in 2007, France has adopted some additional reforms that expanded the scope of anti-corruption offenses. In 2013, it, it um, established a national financial prosecutor with special jurisdiction over economic and financial crime. Um, but up until this year, there had not been a major reform of the French anti-corruption law since 1993. So I understand that uh, Sapin, I'm going to have to call it Sapin 2 because that's just the way Texans talk. So, um, and although I may uh, insult uh, anyone who is a more fluent French speaker than myself, but uh, I understand that uh, the new law has some expanded jurisdictional reach. Could you explain that to us? Yeah, some have called it expanded jurisdictional reach. I mean, I think it could also be described as um, uh, taking away barriers to enforcement. So one of the things the OECD was very critical of was this idea of dual criminality, and essentially what it meant was that the French authorities could not bring a case in an anti-corruption case in France if the conduct at issue occurred abroad, unless that conduct was illegal in both France and in the country where the conduct occurred, and if a complaint was filed by either the victim or the relevant foreign authority. Um, that obviously created a huge barrier to prosecuting foreign corruption cases. France, uh, in its in fairness to France, has brought a fair number of domestic bribery-related cases, um, but that was a real obstacle to, to bringing foreign bribery cases. So it's my understanding this new law created a new anti-corruption agency, which uh, the acronym at least is the uh, AFA. Could you tell us about the charge of the AFA, AFA and uh, what you understand it's going to do uh, under this new law? Sure. The AFA, AFA stands for the French Anti-Corruption Agency, that's the, that's the acronym in French, <clears throat> and it's responsible for assisting public and private sector in preventing and detecting corruption, verifying that companies required to adopt compliance programs have such compliance programs in place. It's going to report possible violations of laws to the relevant prosecutors, and it will oversee corporate monitorship. 
And you'll remember that I mentioned that earlier uh, there, there was another anti-corruption agency that existed. This will replace that agency. That agency was weakened because it was stripped of its investigatory authority. Um, and we'll see what happens with this new agency. Under the initial version of the bill, it was supposed to also have investigatory authority to investigate bribery. As the law was was debated in the French Congress, that was taken away from this agency and given to the prosecutors. So we'll see how that dynamic works of having one agency primarily focused on compliance-related issues and ensuring that companies have compliance programs in place and then reporting any potential violations they identify to the prosecutors. Um, my primary concern is that their, their role is not to identify violations, so they're not likely to be a, a source of, of a tremendous number of cases for the prosecutors, so I may be mistaken. We'll see how that develops. Um, and then splitting the two agencies like that may create some inefficiencies that wouldn't be there otherwise. So I know one of the, uh, I thought, uh, key uh, elements of the new statute is something that's debated here in the United States quite a bit, which is uh, a compliance defense or a compliance program requirements. And uh, could you explain uh, how that is handled in the new law? Yes, I think you're right. That's one of the most fascinating developments. So the, under the new law, French companies will be required to adopt a compliance program, and it's not any French company, but French companies with over 500 employees and an annual gross revenue exceeding 100 million euros. And it requires, you know, a high-level compliance program, and it acknowledges that the, the type of program that will need to be adopted will depend on the type of company adopting it. Um, but it, it requires compliance program elements that are, um, you know, best standard at this point, including code of conduct, internal reporting mechanism, risk assessment, third-party due diligence, those types of, of elements. So uh, I, think it's, I also understand sorry, that there's a, a bit of a grace period before companies have to implement this? There is a grace period. So it's... Um, Six, the first day of the month that comes six months after the law comes into force. So it's about, it'll be six months after, after the law comes into force. The law was adopted November 8th, but it's currently being challenged before the French Constitutional Court. So once that court reviews the law and uh, a final version of the law comes into force, then six months after, companies will be expected to have those programs in place. Well, let's uh, we'll go back to the the uh, review by the French Constitutional Court in a minute because I really wanted to get to one of the areas I find, frankly, the most fascinating with the law, and that's the whistleblower protections. And I, f I find it fascinating as as a student of history. Uh, with uh, French views on whistleblowers and, frankly, the you know continued fallout from World War II, how did this provision get in here? And do you see this as as a dramatic change as I do, or is this just an evolution by the French into you know the 21st century? It's so interesting you mentioned World War II and the fallout from that, and the uh, the implication that that piece of French history has had on French culture that I think really informs the whistleblower protection uh, provisions of this law. Um, I think you are right that uh, this is not going to be a huge change to the existing provisions. It doesn't provide uh, much of an incentive to whistleblowing or whistleblowers. As you know, the, the U.S. law, the Dodd-Frank whistleblower provisions that come into play um, in a lot of fraud cases, provide huge possibility for huge bounties to whistleblowers who provide information that leads to enforcement. And in some cases, under certain provisions, whistleblower provisions in the United States, even individuals who played a role in the wrongdoing stand to collect a bounty. In France, it's quite the opposite. It's more of a fixed approach. So there is no potential benefit to be gained by a whistleblower but um, someone who retaliates against a whistleblower could be punished. And I, I don't think this will change much at all, given the French approach to um, or the French aversion to blowing the whistle as a general matter. Um, but it does tighten the law up a bit. Um, 
the existing whistleblower laws a bit. So the law also introduces U.S.-style deferred prosecution agreements into the French legal landscape uh, in certain cases involving domestic or, or foreign corruption. And uh, really what I would ask you about, Saskia, is I don't think many of my listeners would understand. Uh, they, they probably understand that, that France is a civil law system, but they probably don't understand what that means in terms of prosecutorial power, prosecutorial discretion, and how a DPA would work into the French legal system. Could you give us some of your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I imagine most of your listeners will know that a a deferred prosecution agreement is a tool that's been used quite commonly to resolve FDPA enforcement actions in the United States, and it allows companies to resolve those enforcement actions in exchange for taking on certain obligations, like having, in some cases, having a monitor, certainly adopting a compliance program, uh, agreeing to cease and desist from from the illicit activity. This has been used in the United States, and now it's been used twice in the United Kingdom, both common law countries. And as you mentioned, France is a civil law country, and the system works completely differently. Um, So in order for... A, a deferred prosecution agreement to go forward under this new French law, um, the judge and the prosecutor will play a, a huge role. And my understanding is that the hearings, there have to be hearings that will be public on the facts, on whether the DPA can go forward, which will make it much different than in the U.S. system where, you know, the, the deferred prosecution agreement itself will eventually become public. But the um, the backdoor conversations between the corporate entity, the prosecutor, will be kept uh, confidential, and the judges in the United States essentially play a check the box type exercise. Whereas I expect in France they will be much more active. So one of the uh, interesting discussions at the recent ACI National FCPA conference was around what I'll generally call double double jeopardy in international anti-corruption enforcements. Um, Kara Brockmeyer of the Securities and Exchange Commission and Dan Kahn from the Department of Justice took it uh, really at a little bit different angle because they were advocating increased international cooperation and joint enforcement where there is what they called one pie and the prosecutors across the globe have to come up with an equitable formula to split that pie. And uh, they encouraged companies to self-disclose to multiple uh, regulators in, in different countries, and that would work towards the company's benefit to be leading or, or lending itself to there being only one pie for uh, monetary enforcement fines. Uh I, I, I use that as a very long-winded lead-in to uh, what international double, je- double jeopardy considerations do you see from the new French law? Well, I, I think the double jeopardy considerations will be similar to those companies are facing right now when deciding to disclose an issue over which the U.S. and the U.K. may have jurisdiction or the U.S. and Mexico or the U.S. and Colombia or any any multiple jurisdictions. And the issue really is, uh, you know, first of all, do you, if you're going to disclose in one country, what are the odds the other country is going to find out about it? In this day and age, the odds are pretty good, particularly if you're talking about um, disclosing in the United States and ha- having, you know, another country with possible jurisdiction over the, the issues being a, a key uh, partner of the United States. And I imagine that under with this new French law, the, the the United States will be keen to start to see whether they can work with the French in these kinds of cases. We've certainly seen them work very closely with the British, but increasingly with the Brazilians and the Petrobras investigations and, and other agencies, uh, enforcement authorities, rather. So you mentioned there is an appeal to the French Constitutional Court. I was wondering if you might tell us if, if you know the nature of that appeal and in, in where you, if your crystal ball allows you to see where it may be going, or at least when we might expect some type of uh, final resolution. Sure. So, the law was adopted November 8th, and um, it has since been challenged before the French Constitutional Court. The challenge challenges very specific articles within the law, 
including the whistleblower provisions. Um, the law is actually much goes beyond the um, anti-corruption elements that a lot of our colleagues have focused on. It includes uh, a large piece on insurance-related issues, lobbying-related issues, and some of the provisions of those pieces of the law have also been challenged. Uh, my crystal ball is failing me at this point in terms of figuring out exactly where the Constitutional Court will land, but my sense is that uh, uh, the law will go forward and a large chunk of it will remain unchanged, though certain, certain provisions could be changed and certain provisions could be set aside completely. And um, my understanding from those closer to the issue is that it's very likely to be, uh, the Constitutional Court is likely to decide the issue in the early part of next year, before the French elections in the spring, presidential elections. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on whether or not you think this law would at least perhaps enable France to become a, a, a major player in anti-corruption enforcement across the globe, or whether you think that uh, um, either French re reticence or structural defects in the a AFA might um, really rob this law of, of its full potential. You know, I'm French-American, and as I told you, I grew up in South Carolina, so I can also speak Southern if I need to. <laughs> um, but <laughs> so because, of, because I'm French-American, I do really hope that this will increase enforcement in France. If countries are not all on board, in particular, particularly countries in the developed world, not all on board on this, it does create an uneven playing field. It... Um, I mean, it creates disparities in, in enforcement. And um, and frankly, I mean, corruption is bad for business, it's bad for development, it's bad in all sorts of ways. So my, uh, my hope is that France will, um, will take this seriously and will really start enforcing these cases. I've noted a number of structural deficiencies in, in the old law and in particularly in the new law in, in the article that you have. And um, I just hope that they don't get so in the way of enforcement that this doesn't change much. But we will see. So, uh, Saskia, thanks uh, so much. I uh, was wondering if anyone wanted to uh, follow up with you uh, on any questions, if they could email you, and if so, how would they do it? Absolutely. So it, you've mentioned my name, though. It's a bit difficult to spell for listeners. So uh, my email is S Z A N. D is in dog, I E H at milchev, M I L C H E V dot com. So I've been visited with, visiting with Saskia Zandier. She is a co author of the Miller and Chevalier uh, newsletter um, in, entitled France's Anti Corruption Law A Game Changer or More of the Same. I'm going to link to that in the show notes. I really appreciate you taking the time to visit with me. This has uh, been very informative, and I hope that uh, I can have you back on the podcast and we can continue the conversation where in the next podcast you can tell me about French enforcement efforts. That's right. I hope we'll have that, that opportunity very soon. Well, thanks for the opportunity. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to <clears throat> episode 293 of the FCPA Compliance Report. I have two calls to action for you. The first is I'm developing a list of questions for my next mailbag episode. So if you have any questions, please email them to me. I'd love to uh, uh, answer your questions. The second thing is if you listen to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate us. It would definitely help in our rankings. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening to the FCPA Compliance Report.